Good afternoon. Are you connected to the internet? It's, uh, my name is Aurelian Kriyutsu and I'm a uh, director of the Tocqueville program. I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to our first Tocqueville lecture series today, which brings to uh, campus one of uh, our alumni, Jun Mint, who is an associate professor of political science at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. Jun uh, earned his PhD uh, from Indiana University, actually from the Austin workshop in 2005. And he's one of our uh, uh, alumni that we are most proud of. Uh, he, um, his research, uh, he worked here under uh, the supervision of Lynn Ostrom and a few others who are present in this room. Uh, his research examines uh, the re roles of individuals and groups in the dynamic relationship between social changes and global environmental changes. And the focus of Tun's research has been uh, on democracy, development, globalization, and sustainability. He has published articles in a variety of journals from ecology and society, um, issue, legal issues on Burma Journal, perspective on politics, and he's the author of Governing International Reverse Polycentric Politics in the Mekong and the Rhine. Uh, Tun has been uh, very involved in um, um, studying democracy in Burma, as uh, some of you uh, well know. And today's topic um, on which you will be speaking is citizen science in a democracy the case of Taiwan research. The format will be uh, the following. Uh, Tun will speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and then he will take questions and answers from me. So please join me in welcoming Tun Min back to the auction. Thank you very much and, uh, for that nice introduction. And also, thank you all for coming. And this is the room where I started my journey of <laughs> the, this intellectual endeavor, if it actually took, so to speak. And I started here with uh, a graduate seminar in this room. And I defended my dissertation in this room with two of my advisors there, <laughs> Professor John Elbergate and Professor Patrick Omera here today. Uh, Professor Omera was a co-chair with Lynn Ostrom in this room. So, and then, after I defended my dissertation, Lynn asked me to teach the second part of the graduate seminar in the spring while she was teaching the fall, uh, the first part of the seminar. So I taught two spring in this room, uh, the second part of the seminar, that, uh, that the workshop seminar. So I felt, I feel the weight of this room. <laughs> and at the same time, the vibe of this room, too. So in that sense, uh, so I, I, I hope I would, I would take I will hold to the standard set by this room and several colleagues who pass through this room. So my topic is uh, citizen science and a democracy, uh, the case of Thai Ban research, which is Thai Ban meaning Thai village, so Thai or Thai villagers research. And that's the topic here. And I'm going to be sort of phrasing democracy in a more of Tophelian sense of democracy based on the association and lives of people. Uh, rather than just the electoral democracy that we all seem to be uh, quite familiar with the global neoliberal democracy. So in that sense, I'll go straight down to the case uh, study, and then at the end, I'll generate a series of questions, because I'm still struggling with this, this science and democracy, or tacit knowledge and local knowledge of democracy, in that sense. So this is a Mekong River Basin, as you see these, uh, the, the blue uh, river, uh, and then uh, one of the key, well, the main <coughs> tributary of the Mekong, uh, actually located in Thailand, by the name of Moon River, or uh, people spell M-U-N or M-O-O-N, Moon River. And Moon River is this, this river basin here. It's a gigantic river basin. This is the most important river basin in Thailand uh, in, in, uh, after Chao Phraya River. Chao Phraya was uh, important because of where the king resides. This river is important because where people really reside in terms of working and living and making their own livelihood through the fisheries. So uh, the dam, uh, the case actually is, uh, is a part of this, uh, uh, consequences of this farming dam with the one that uh, came out this Taiwan research, or villagers research in that sense. So that is about five kilometers from the mouth of the Moon River, which will be flowing into the Mekong, that is in, uh, International River. And here are the sites where I did my field research in that sense. So the main village that is affected by, or that was affected by, uh, this dam is uh, this village. And I spent about a total of six months back and forth between here and Chiang Mai University when I was doing field research in Thailand. Uh, uh, so 
this dam is a sort of uh, the uh, one of run of the river type uh, dam. It's not gravity fed dam that you would see this uh, concrete block. This one actually is, uh, has eight sluice gates and they can be open uh, as needed, depending on the, uh, the volume of the water at, at this reservoir site, if you will. This is a reservoir. Uh, basically, it's so, uh, upstream of the Moon River, downstream five kilometers all the way down to what is where the Mekong. Uh, is. Uh, there are about 65 villages directly affected, directly in the sense of uh, their livelihood activity, which is the main activity is a fish fishing, fishing from this uh, this uh, Moon River. Um, so uh, fish uh, fish are very um, dynamic in the sense of their 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 behavior. Uh, when the rainy season, when the river uh, the water rain fall down, fish become very uh, animated and happy and uh, especially the young one will be very playful in that sense because as soon as the water drop from the rain hit the surface of the river it's just exciting thing happen to their communities right so then when uh, young fish are healthy playful eating a lot what happened well they mate right so then they got uh, female fish with eggs we'll be looking for a uh, spawning ground what happened then from the Mekong uh, all the across all the river? They're looking for spawning ground in a more stable water area, like a wetland or swampy, and, or maybe rapid area where the rocks will protect their nesting, if you will. Right. So fishery is actually a natural uh, phenomena of like ATM machine bank, like villager would describe. They would pull out from their ATM machine, and then you know they make their livelihood, and then to, uh, in that nesting. So. This is really for them. It's a bank. It's, a, it's a, for them. It's a livelihood source of livelihood. So, because of that, the Thai state, when it was imagining this project, uh, the key issue was how do we protect the fishery, and how do we make sure that the villager will have at least fish to consume, if not commercially, uh, activity that they would use to do. So they came up with a genius idea, which basically uh, comes from a textbook. It's called the fish. Maybe it's coming low, okay. That means I need to have power. Okay. So the, uh, the engineer who designed this dam came up with, uh, a, 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 the, the, uh, came up with this thing called fish ladder. Okay. So this is an uh, engineer basically took out of the uh, textbook and they said, okay, we can solve that problem, the fishery problem, fish migrant problem, by building this fish letter. Fish are supposed to take this letter up uh, <laughs> and then go to the uh, reservoir. And villager right out when they saw the picture, it's not going to work. <laughs> said, you know, this fish are not going to be, <laughs> you know, going through this channel, uh, this channel and go to the reservoir. So I went to that uh, fish letter myself and looked at it and it's supposed to be the one the gates are closed the water has to be sufficient here so fish can especially the small one that I'm talking about are supposed to be going through reservoir and then you will have fishery up there and then people will have livelihood up there right so that was the idea but I didn't see any fish I asked actually villagers who are hanging out there with me and then, uh, I asked them you know have you ever seen fish and the, one of the lady responded women responded saying Imagine you are pregnant, and you have to climb this human being she's talking about. Imagine you're pregnant. If you have to climb this ladder up from the bottom all the way to the top, you won't make it, she said. So basically, fish are not going to be able to do it. So basically, that's what, it, what, what has happened, and villagers' uh, uh, voices were ignored. So villagers took, from the very uh, first uh, day the, the dam project was announced, which was in 1989, on the street and protested. And the first thing they did was basically wrote a letter to the prime minister saying, you know, your design of the, the dam and your design of fish letter is not going to solve the problem that we have, which is a fishery that we rely on for uh, feeding our children, making our livelihoods, sending our kids to schools, healthcare, you name it, all of the livelihood uh, activity that they rely on. So they basically did uh, protest first, which I call it a forging identity, meaning they have to, because they were going against the urbanites who need electricity, who is supporting the project, so they had to define who they were as fishermen or river people, the term they use, river people, and they have to tell the through the media who they are and what they will be uh, losing from this project. So basically it's sort of a media campaign 
uh, that's telling the radio uh, stations and newspaper men and women that our lives are going to be ruined and trying to define uh, that, that their lives are so tied to the river and the fishery. And that uh, protest era is from 1989 to 1997 economic crisis. 1997, there was Asian economic crisis. So that era, I call it basically defining their identity period uh, in, in that sense. And I went through several prime ministers and several military coups in that era. era. And of course, it's a, in terms of political freedom, it's up and down, not necessarily free. In some cases, they were, their houses were burned down. In some cases, they were uh, killed uh, by the police. In some cases, uh, they were basically arrested without any uh, process of rule of law. Uh, so, and then 1997 crisis basically posed a question to the Thai society, uh, which was the way in which we have been developing our economic system and our society need to be rethought. We think we have to rethink about uh, how we are developing the Thai economic and political system and society as a whole. And that 1997 uh, crisis basically created a political space for villagers like these Patnung villagers, not just this dam, but the whole throughout Thailand since 1964, uh, when the Thai government, Thai king, started this modernization project with the neoliberalizing Thai economy. Uh, if you look at the one, uh, five, um, 500 baht currency uh, 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 Thai dollar bill, uh, the pictures are the dam and then the king. And that is a pro the, the progress of Thailand, modernization of Thailand. So dams are basically considered as the king's uh, uh, project that are important for so developing Thai society. So for villagers to go against the dam is also to go against the monarch. It's a very serious business we're talking about. So, so, uh, uh, so the King Never Smile book by Paul, um, Yale University Press in Thailand, uh, talk about how Thai King's image is so sensitive uh, in Thailand. Thai you can't even um, draw the King's uh, image if you are not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so such kind of uh, political condition, they basically struggled this pro through the protest in 1997 what happened was that there was a constitutional reform movement to call for the rights of the villagers, who, who, can, who, who should be the primary right to define their own property in, in, in terms of forest and rivers and land use sort of right. And that uh, movement actually was able to put some of the constitutional clauses into the constitution that doesn't survive in 2016 constitution that was just approved August 7th, uh, last, last month. Uh, but 2007 constitution, 2014 constitution, all of that maintain the right that I'm going to be showing you a little bit later. Uh, all of those villages' right to sue the state. But now it's all demolished. All of this is, 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 is basically history now. What I'm showing is a history in Thailand. Now, then the villages took this movement from to 1997 to 2000, took into another level, which was more of what I would call it globalizing or internationalizing their protests. They, they found that just protesting in Thailand is not enough. You need some international support and international framework to move through what they want to do. So they coordinate with several NGOs, including the War Commission on Dam. Uh, they coordinate that. So in 2000, the prime minister, who is now refugee, running around the globe, Thaksin Shinawatra, basically formed a party called Thai Rat Thai, meaning Thai Love Thai Party. And their political party mobilized their campaign through this, these cases, especially this Patmongan case. And he made in the campaign promise, if I win this election, I'm going to shut down this dam, and I will appoint scientific commission to study. And then I will decide based on that data and the scientific committee that he will appoint. And then I'll decide whether this dam should be permanently removed from the river or whether the dam will continue, the dam should continue or not. And that was his campaign in 2000. He won't landslide. Uh, one of, and the second uh, part of his, uh, his uh, promise was, of course, Thai, well known uh, Thai healthcare system. If you visit a uh, clinic, you pay only 35 baht. And that was the second. And then the third is he will make Thailand great and so on. Of course, and especially he would make the Thai people, meaning that people who rely on the land and rivers and forests, where they will be his constituent. And he, he promised that their rights and their uh, their democracy or their freedom will be more increased under his, his, um, his administration. And he won't landslide, meaning that he didn't need to form any coalition in the parliamentary system. 
Um, and this is probably, that was probably, uh, no probably, that was the first time in Thai political history happened. One party, landslide war, and was able to form the government as he or she likes it. In, that case, in this case, he likes it as he likes it. So he then uh, won the election. At the time, I was doing field research. And at that internationalization stage, uh, villagers also went to the War Commission on Dam Meeting in uh, Sri Lanka. The leader of this protest went to Sri Lanka. And at that time, the War Commission on Dams, Blue City, was selecting cases around the world just to study them and then show the world that the consequences of these large dams. And the protest leader was, uh, Thai protest leader, the Pamung Dam protest leader was there, and he pushed through the meeting that Pamung Dam should be selected as one of the 10 cases that the Blue City would study. So the Blue City agreed to select it at the end of the meeting. So he was able to push this protest leader. Um, so basically, now you have 2001 released the Blue City study, including the Pak Mundan case. Now, the Prime Minister who won the election promised it would shut down and let, uh, let the Independent Commission study. He started his commission now. Now, villagers were told, the protesters were told, okay, he had an ice cream with the villager on the street in Bangkok. Uh, as I was watching him in protest, I was also a doing field research, and he basically told the protest leader, okay, uh, we are going to uh, close this term for about 2000, he won in 2000, November to 2000, uh, uh, 2001, November. So about 12 month period, and during the period, we want to study how your life improved without the dam. And I'm going to appoint two universities to do the study, uh, independent, two groups, two independent group study. And that will be Konkan University and Ubon Rajasthan University. So those two university professor, researcher, scientists were appointed in the, uh, the Prime Minister Commission. So they all went out and they studied. The protest villager said, when you come to our villages, when you want to know about us, when you want to study about us, you have to ask questions. How much money we make from fishing? How many kids do we have? Kids do we have? What kind of household do we have, right? They decided to do their own research. Okay. We're not going to trust you anymore because they have been protesting 12 years. And so they started this Thai villagers research, now known as the Thai Bank research. Okay. So what I'm going to do is uh, to show you uh, uh, the, the, the video of that research, and which will be about 10 minutes, because instead of me explaining what the Thai Bank research is, I want the villagers to explain to you what they did. Okay. So that would be what we do here. Um, so this is a video after the Prime Minister promised, close the, uh, open the gates, uh, and, and the, the two teams uh, from the Prime Minister's office went to the villages, and Prime Minister himself also went to these villages, and villagers responded, we're, we're going to do our own research, and we'll produce our own report too. You have to read that report from us too, and in addition to two commissions that he, the Prime Minister appointed. So this is the video. ยืนคือการใช้ความรู้วิธีที่ผ่านมาเมื่อคณะรัฐมนตรีมติให้เปิดขึ้นเพื่อศึกษาถึงผลกระทบหลังวิจัยไทยบ้านจึงเกิดข
ต้องเจอต้องเจมันตลอดคือในหมู่บ้านหนึ่งสีเข้าสีแตกต่างมาเป็นผ่านป่าคนหนึ่งเป็นพ่อหนาปุ่มคนหนึ่งใครแท้บ้านในหมู่บ้านล่งหากันไอสีห้าคือมือแล้วได้กันแล้วแกแกหามาอะไรกันคือเอามาทายผ่าดับผ่าไปบรรยากาศแม่มูลหลังเปิดเขื่อนเต็มไปด้วยชีวิตชีวาปลาจากแม่น้ำโขงอบพยพเข้ามาเป็นจำนวนมากชาวบ้านออกหาปลากันแทบทุกครัวเรือนที่ไปอยู่ต่างถิ่นพอรู้ข่าวก็พากันกลับมาขณะเดียวกับที่นักวิจัยไทยบ้านใน6กหบ้านได้เริ่มงานวิจัยพันปลาจากชีวิตจริงกลานปลาที่เก่งและจำนวนที่สุด20คนแต่ละคนมีประสบการณ์หาปลาในแม่มูลมาไม่ต่ำกว่า50ปีถูกเลือกมาเป็นวิทยากรด้านพันปลาร่วมการระดมความรู้ร่วมกันวิเคราะห์ข้อมูลบางทีเป็นวันในคืนนะคะมานั่งกันนั่งบันทึกคือคนบันทึกก็บันทึกแบบคนเล่าให้ฟังก็เล่าเล่าเล่าเล่าให้ฟังมีการแลกเปลี่ยนพอได้ปลามาบางคนก็บอกว่าปลานี้บางคนก็บอกปลาปลานี้คือบางทีลูกมันมันดูไม่ชัดเนี่ยก็ต้องไปหาตัวจริงมามาวางว่าปลาตัวนี้จริงๆว่ามันเรียกว่าปลาอะไรมันอยู่ตรงไหนมันกินอะไรเป็นอาหารใช้เครื่องมืออะไรหามันขึ้นเดือนไหนมันไข่เดือนไหนแล้วเนี่ยเอามาวางกันเลยแล้วก็นักวิจัยก็ช่วยกันพิจารณาเอาความรู้ที่ตัวเองสั่งสมมาเนี่ยพิจารณาเลยว่ามันมันคืออะไรด้วยวิธีการเช่นนี้ความรู้ต่างๆที่สั่งสมมาหลายชั่วอายุคนเป็นภูมิปัญญาของผู้คนริมสองฝั่งแม่น้ำมูลได้รับการรวบรวมจดบันทึกไว้อย่างเป็นระบบไม่เฉพาะเรื่องเกี่ยวกับพันปลาเท่านั้นนักวิจัยไทยบ้านยังได้รวบรวมความรู้เรื่องระบบนิเวศแม่น้ำมูลเครื่องมีหาปลาพืชผักสมุนไพรเรื่องเกษตรปริมูลและเรื่องวิถีชีวิตและวัฒนธรรมโดยชาวบ้านเป็นผู้วิจัยประมาณ200คนใช้เวลาในการทำวิจัย1ปี2เดือนมีผู้ช่วยวิจัยเป็นนักวิชาการอิสระและนักเรียนประมาณ20คนผลการศึกษาพบว่ามีปลาธรรมชาติกลับสู่แม่น้ำมูลถึง148ชนิดในจำนวนนี้123ชนิดเป็นปลาจากแม่น้ำขงนั่นแสดงว่าปีแรกของการเปิดเขื่อนกว่าครึ่งหนึ่งของพันปลาในแม่น้ำมูลแต่เดิมได้กลับสู่แม่มูลวิจัยไทยบ้านยังพบด้วยว่าการอพยพของปลาระหว่างแม่น้ำขงกับแม่น้ำมูลนั้นเกิดขึ้นตลอด11เดือนไม่ได้มีการอพยพเพียงสีเดือนอย่างที่เข้าใจกันก่อนหน้านี้ระบบนิเวศของแม่น้ำมูลฟื้นตัวขึ้นได้อย่างรวดเร็วภายหลังเปิดประตูเขื่อนแกงทั้ง35แก่งโผล่พ้นน้ำระบบความสัมพันธ์ที่สลับซับซ้อนตามธรรมชาติของแก่งขุนถ้ำวังเวินเหวกลับมาเป็นทั้งที่อยู่อาศัยแหล่งอาหารที่วางไข่แหล่งอนุบาลลูกอ่อนของปลาพร้อมๆการฟื้นคืนของป่าวงป่าทามบางส่วนพืชน้ำมาแมลงพืชผักสมุนไพรนานาชนิดนำความอุดมสมบูรณ์กลับมาน้ำที่เคยเน่าเสียกลับมาใช้สะอาดอีกครั้งชาวบ้านมีแหล่งอาหารพอเพียงทุกครอบครัวมีรายได้เพิ่มขึ้นส่งผลต่อเศรษฐกิจชุมชนโดยรวมการศึกษายังพบด้วยว่าหลังเปิดคืนมีคนบริเวณป่ามูลกลับลงมาหาปลาในแม่น้ำมูลถึง 6,915 ถั่วเรือนหรือคิดเป็นร้อยละ 94.91 วันวันหนึ่งบางครั้งเนี่ยเขาไม่จำเป็นจะต้องใช้เงินเลยทีนี้เขาก็สามารถอยู่ได้เขาอยู่ได้ด้วยอะไรหนึ่งมีอาหารทางอาหารทางกายอาหารทางใจอาหารทางใจคือเรื่องของการที่ได้อยู่กับธรรมชาติการได้อยู่ในชุมชนอย่างบูรณ์ไม่เหงาไม่เหงาง้อยอยู่ด้วยวิธีที่ของตัวเองมีมันดีขึ้นไหนฮะปูฮะปลาไหนขายเอาเงินแล้วก็ออกมาใส่ใจอยากกินจมก็ได้กินอยากกินลาบก็ได้กินอยากกินแกงก็ได้กินนะอยากหาเมื่อฝากที่ฝากนอกก็ไปหาสิเข้าไปหาอีกงานวิจัยตรงนี้เราได้เห็นเราได้เห็นอะไรที่มันที่มันเกิดขึ้นในเรื่องของวิถีชีวิตชุมชนเยอะมากในปีที่ผ่านมาว่าที่ผ่านมาในช่วงปีเผื่อนี่คนหนุ่มๆไม่มีเลยนะคะแล้วคนแก่เนี่ยวันวันหนึ่งเนี่ยการกินอาหารของเขานี่เหมือนแบบจําใจต้องกินแต่ว่าพอหลังเปิดเขื่อนเนี่ยเขามีอาหารปลาเยอะมากคนไปหาปลาก็จะเรียกคือคือเขาไม่ได้ซื้อไงคะเขาก็จะรู้สึกเออเรียกคนนั้นมากินด้วยเลยเรียกคนนี้มากินด้วยเรียกคนนั้นมากินด้วยก็จะรวมกันกินอาหารบางทีก็ได้ปลามาก็ไม่รู้จะขายไปทําไมก
แบ่งกันไปเอาไม่ใหญ่คนนี้ตัวนึงไม่ใหญ่คนนั้นกดตัวหนึ่งอะไรเงี้ยก็มันก็จะมีบรรยากาศแบบนี้เกิดขึ้นซึ่งซึ่งพวกเราที่ผ่านมาเนี่ยคือเราเราเห็นแบบนี้แล้วเราก็ก็รู้สึกรู้สึกดีมากเลยนะคะรู้สึกว่านี่คือคือบรรยากาศของของความเป็นชุมชนความเป็นอยู่แบบที่เขาเคยอยู่มานั้นถือว่าเขามีความสุขซึ่งซึ่งซึ่งเรื่องเหล่านี้เนี่ยเป็นเรื่องที่เราเราได้เห็นเราได้เห็นภาพชัดเจนในปีที่ผ่านมาว่าทําไมชาวบ้านถึงต้องถึงต้องพุ่งเทชีวิตทั้งชีวิตเพราะอันนี้ถือว่าชีวิตทั้งชีวิตแล้วนะคะว่าเพื่อที่จะเอาแม่น้ำมูลกลับคืนมางานวิจัยไทยบ้านเป็นงานวิจัยของชาวบ้านที่พยายามรวบรวมองค์ความรู้ผลกระทบจากการเปิดและปิดเขื่อนทั้งที่เป็นความเปลี่ยนแปลงของระบบนิเวศและวิถีชีวิตชุมชนโดยคาดหวังว่าผลการวิจัยจะนําไปสู่การตัดสินใจในเชิงนโยบายที่จะให้มีการเปิดเขื่อนอย่างถาวรเพื่อให้การฟื้นฟูธรรมชาติความอุดมสมบูรณ์และวิถีชีวิตของผู้คนสองฝั่งแม่น้ำมูลดำเนินไปอย่างต่อเนื่องและเป็นหลักประกันสุขภาวะที่ยั่งยืนถึงคนรุ่นลูกรุ่นหลาน So they did that research and they produced this uh, this book. This is the, the, the research that they compiled. And then they sent this to the prime minister. And prime minister read it. And also they sent it also to the World Commission on Dam, and they sent it also to the UNES, uh, the WHO UNESCO uh, Education Department. Who and subsidized the production of these materials? How the, did they pay for it? This, uh, this is a local effort. Uh, Chiang Mai University professors and the student who is also translating. And Oxfam America funded them uh, uh, through, the, through their project. Uh, then I think WWF was also only a funding for the fishery research uh, for the some scientists. And Smithsonian sent their own independent scientist Robert Tyson, who I met in interview for the p r a t u e So he was also uh, supported by the Smithsonian. Of course, uh, Robert Tyson and the villagers share the knowledge because he has to be there with the villagers, uh, uh, trying to understand the local knowledge. Right? So they did this research, and Prime Minister read it, and Prime Minister thought this is so <coughs> excellent that villager responded to this uh, this request he made, uh, this mission he, commission he appointed. So he has now four reports to decide: two commissions report, the War Commission on Dams study, and the Village of the Taiban research study. And he read four of them. Uh, then after that, he decided to meet with these 35 villagers out of 100, 200 researchers. He selected 35 of them to meet at the government house, Prime Minister's uh, decision-making room, on November 11, 2002, and it was broadcasted live. Uh, on the C-SPAN of China. The level of discussion between these fishermen who did not even finish high school, some of them, and the level of discussion the Prime Minister who has PhD, it was dynamic for Thai society to look at it. In the history of Thailand, this has never happened because the, the villagers are regarded, these people, especially people from Isan, are regarded as a poor, backward, dirty, you know, they are uneducated, <laughs> actually. And so that's what have been their image. And so now here, the prime minister and these villagers having uh, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. live discussion with lunch provided was just amazing in Thai democracy, the moment of democracy. So, so the WHO, which read the report, decided to give them the most healthy community award. I mean, this is such a dynamic and healthy community. And so they gave the award to the, the villagers. Here is the man. Who led that 35 people come, uh, delegation to the prime minister house? This is he is entering to the gate uh, to meet with the prime minister, He's holding here the, the award from the WHO in his hand uh, as he is going to. So th this is a, such a uh, important moment for this movement, Pamun Dan movement, and it, 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 it shows how their research, the village of research, uh, were quite uh, important for their point of view and their uh, influence on this project. After the meeting with the, with the villagers, uh, the prime minister decided to open four months a year. These two states would be open four months. Right? He, he, made, he made that decision uh, uh, after meeting with him. And he, he said uh, it, for, the four months was 
two of the discussion, he was asking, when do fish migrate from the Mekong? And what season, all of that question. It determined that between May, and June, June, July, August, September, at the end of September, uh, will be the most important period <coughs> for the fishery to migrate and to have spawning ground upstream, and therefore those four months are the one that the gates will be open. And now that is what the decision is uh, as a history of this stand. Without that research they did, uh, it would have been quite uh, impossible to have this four months opening. Of course, their desire was to completely demolish this dam. Or some villager, actually the man who, I, uh, who was holding the picture, I asked him, what should we do if, you, if the government decides to uh, stop this dam? He said, keep it there as a museum of development. He said. <laughs> and that would be his, his desire. Just show this is a, what the development for Thailand means and how this museum should elaborate the livelihood and democracy of these freedom of these people and so on. So that is the story that I, um, uh, I, would, I, I would like to share. Um, before that, though, uh, as I alluded to the constitutional clause, um, this is the constitution of 1997, where the, the rights of the villagers to sue the state, if the state project violate their livelihood activity was written. And this language in Thai was written by a professor who, a researcher, mostly anthropologist and economist and political scientist at Chiang Mai University, to push through the Reform Constitutional Writing Commission. And they were able to uh, make this, uh, this. So the right of a person to give the state, and here, this is a language that is unknown in the Thai history. The right of a person, the citizen, to give the state the right. Okay? It is not the state that have a right on the control of land and water, but rather a person. And so this is really a reversal of a Thai history in the sense of democracy in the state, the people in the state. In the preservation and exploitation of natural resources and biological diversity and the protection, promotion, and preservation of the quality of life shall be protected as provided by law. Any project or activity which may seriously affect the quality of the environment shall not be permitted unless its impact on the quality of the environment have been studied and evaluated by independent organization, not the state one. So the right of a person to sue a government agency, like the agency that led this project, IGET, uh, uh, state enterprise, local administration, or other state organization to perform duties as provided by law under paragraph one and two shall be protected in that sense. So that was what they did in 1997. What they did with this research was in 2001, getting the four months opening, so quite influential in the sense of the democracy of these people, in a sense. Without that local tested <coughs> knowledge, it would be quite impossible because, because the science that commission, the Prime Minister Commission going to be, is neatly going to be packaged in a way that we researchers go out and quantify things and package our own scientific sort of endeavor. So to me, the, the questions raised about the, the, most, the notion of democracy and science uh, are enormous here. I, and I, I find this so important to raise the question of, question like, why are tested and local knowledge knowledges perceived to be inferior for government decision, right? To what extent standardization of data, knowledge, and science is a threat to association of life and democracy? Here, yeah, Tophelian democracy I'm talking about. What I mean by standardization is if we look at our shoe sizes, we have six, eight, right? Seven, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and all this. What about if your feed is 6.7? Your feed is 6.4 or 7.3 or 7.7. .7. You effectively are marginalized by that kind of science, right? If, if, if we call it. And similarly, I think uh, James Scott probably would be more qualified than I am in terms of explaining the consequences of standardization uh, as he went through the, uh, the art of not being governed uh, and other work. So he, he went through this uh, New England towns where it used to be just the town leading toward village B, leading toward village A. And then, so village A and B, when they're talking about leading toward village B, they know which road they're referring to. But then the village C might be also talking to the another road leading towards village B. They know each other which road the individuals are tacitly local knowledge way referring to. But well, if you consider that situation, calling 911 on one of those road to village B, you will not be getting ambulance as soon as uh, the soonest you, you need it. 
So the county came in and gave Route 1, Route 2, Route 3, Route 4, and standardized it, right? But the consequences are there, as Scott pointed out. So I'm wondering about this standardization of data, knowledge, and sciences. To what extent is it really a threat to such kind of association of life that you imagine before standardization happened? The third question, how does the standardization of science contribute to growing mistrust on governmental institution and formal education around the world? Formal education, yeah. Denmark probably is one of the leading countries where we call it folk education uh, movement in Denmark happening. In the US, there are some community already also having uh, uneducating the public, basically. The education process, process anymore. So I, I think we need to understand to what extent science really contribute to this mistrust on the institution, Eurocentric science, what I mean by that. The fourth question I, I, I ask is, is Eurocentric science incongruent with Tophelian democracy in an innate moral sense, meaning that original sense, does science and democracy, science meaning scientific, endeavor reproach, and democracy, are they congruent or incongruent? To what extent are they incongruent? So that, those are the kind of questions that I am getting out of this digesting these data and the research. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes? We could have time for questions, so if you'd like to raise your hand, you can feel the questions. And sure. If you can introduce yourself with your name. Yeah. Uh, my name is Federica Carogati. Um, I have, uh, I guess, one clarification and two questions. Okay. The clarification is about the Article 56 that you showed, uh, the concept of independent organization, how is it defined? And does that make Taiwan constitutionally irrelevant uh, by virtue of not being an independent organization in the sense of a, <coughs> an organization that has no direct interest in the in the way that the, um, the, 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 the information is gathered? Uh, the two questions are, I was struck in the video, uh, the, the woman, the research assistant, said in these uh, uh, village meetings, uh, those who speak keep speaking and those who listen keep listening. And I wonder, you have, uh, and I got in late, so correct me on anything if I'm wrong or, uh, or miss something. Um, you have followed these meetings uh, and researched them. Yeah. Did you see, uh, what, what, is, what are the constituencies uh, who are the people participating in these meetings? The video was striking in the sense that women and men and uh, uh, older and, and younger people seem to be uh, part of these conversations. And I wonder if there are any dynamics of a kind of like a, a greater group cohesiveness that you see emerging from these meetings. The third question is, this is the second question. Uh, this is a, this, your, your implications and in general the, the presentation uh, kept me um, uh, thinking about Plato and the, uh, the degree to which uh, he was, uh, seemed to be completely in agreement with you that there is a kind of technique, there's a kind of expertise where uh, 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 experts of any kind of like a, regardless of where they come from, can contribute to. So the example of fishery management, for example, would be one of those that Plato would be like, sure, you know, if you have expertise, you can come to the table. Is this in any way um, uh, kind of like a extendable to uh, social political, uh, economic institutions. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Should we collect, uh, if you have similar line of thought and question? Yeah, I'd like to know? collect three questions and then I'll give Wait, you the answer. Every question. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. they're all good questions. Yeah, right? it's, I, no, no, don't be sorry, but you should talk. I, I don't okay. think you should collect any more questions. Okay. You can answer okay. seven questions So Federica asked three questions. It's established there were three. Right. Yeah. 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 Sorry about that. <laughs> Those are enormous questions that I really love, uh, the question that you asked. The first question, the clarification question is, uh, uh, the research itself wasn't funded by any international NGO, uh, the, this research. In fact, after the research, Villager produced a Thai version of the, this is a more fine-tuned version, Oxford version of the book. Uh, Thai version of the, the, the one that I, I looked at and also through with my, my translator was basically uh, quite primitive in terms of the way in which pictures were organized and so on. Um, so it was originally they themselves, with their own desire, decided to do without any prompt of funding. So in essence, independent is quite independent, yes. Then Oxfam saw that villagers were doing such a project, and they can see you can motiv motivate people in Washington to give the money to this project. Oxfam basically took this as their cause. And now, if you look at the archive of this German, this research, 
it will be all under the IUCN and Oxfam supported sort of project. Right, fact, but I think is, independent in a constitutional sense here to mean that the actors c conducting the research would have no, um, what is the word I'm looking for, uh, a conflict of interest in the results of the inquiry themselves. Obviously, these villagers do have mm -hmm, a yeah. conflict of interest. Yeah. Um, so, in, in that, because of because of that, uh, well, then you, you're two two types of independent we're talking about. One is independent for foreign. Uh, donors and, yes, and one. Yes. The other is uh, basically constitutionally in, in a sense of norms and perception. Are they independent actors in that sense? Right. In that sense, uh, in fact, the Thai public and the several journalists wrote about them. At the very beginning, was quite negative about them because they were backward people, and so they line they they line their language line up with the other knights and the elites, uh, the yellow shirt group in, in Thailand, uh, quite well. But then later on, they understood the contribution of these villagers is not just about asking for compensation or asking for political right. This is related to Thai society's uh, question, the question of 1997 posing it. What type of development do we want as a Thai people? And that, therefore, several journalists uh, basically decided to uh, uh, write in favor of the villager later on. So that basically the perception of if you were if you take constitution now the term beyond the language the text of constitution but rather rooted in the norms and social yeah. trust and relationship which is a trophelian sense of association uh, life sense and how that constitutional foundation animated this is obviously powerful yeah. right that's question uh, the clarification number one uh, the second question that you ask is this, this um, to, uh, do this experts knowledge um, have something, this expert mean the expertise of villagers or the, the commission's uh, expert? Uh, villagers. The villagers. Is it expandable to social and economic? This is a fantastic question in the sense that also relates to your first question too, because if we have such kind of understanding of constitutional governance rooted in the norms and association of life and social understanding at the, at the fun, fundamental sense of that level, I would say yes. The answer is that yes. They have. They, they have. Uh, they can be extended to shaping political institutions. Uh, what would be the rule of law emerging out of such kind of expertise, right? Versus the rule of law that would be written by a law graduate of Cambridge University from Thailand, just like the dam letter uh, engineers who learn their engineering technique in Switzerland. Uh, Russia and come back here and they can solve this fishery problem by installing such type of letter. Similarly, if you take that constitutional clause, a clause that you learn from the West, just like the letter is, put it into the Thai constitution, would it work? Obviously not. So with the knowledge that you ask the question, the initial question, be extendable to this social uh, uh, economic institution development, I would say yes, it, it does have a role to play in it. But they also have to be somewhat, uh, I guess, coll collaborated by some of these outside experts too. You can't just go with the villagers and be it. That, that. So I'm not going to be um, romanticizing these villagers as they all be the source of constitutional foundation of Thai society, but rather they have to sort of uh, communicate one another. I think that was a, the third question, right? Not second question. Yes, right. thank you. Yes. Can I just comment on that? Yes, please. I thought it was very. It's your standardization point. Yeah. And they seem to do that very successfully and form the basis for the key uh, operational question, which is mm -hmm. can you open it and close it mm -hmm. and it will restore? Yeah. And when do you do it? So yeah. it, it, it did seem to work remarkably well, mm -hmm. kind of mashing those up. Yeah, thank you. I, mean, that's, I, I would agree with, with that. Um, Jeff, do you want to follow up on that one? Yes. Uh, yeah, I guess I, yeah. Yes, directly. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, no, do, do your thing. Go with your standard rules. Why don't you have hand? Do you, are you yeah. connected to that, too? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, I guess yeah. so. Uh, great presentation, though, for your great case. Um, I wonder if there's a strategic choice for you, if you could talk about open, selecting the term citizen science, or if that's their strategic choice. Uh, 
there's quite a background that I could bring to this about this, but I recently in an assessment that uh, you know, incorporates indigenous and local knowledge, a lot of the people representing indigenous and local knowledge had uh, a huge problem in considering citizen science as part of indigenous local knowledge. Mm -hmm. So there's a, quite a conversation there that I could, uh, uh, we could talk about later, which is, sort of was really interesting. But who picked the term citizen science? Because I, I look briefly, you don't discuss the term very much here. That's right. Mm -hmm. So is that their choice? Is that part of you know uh, trying to frame it in a way that seems more legitimate? What, what's the politics of the I term? picked the term citizen science to describe this, for the lack of the term, for describing such kind of science. I, I see that there's a, a, a some innate standing and independence and values in this science, which is different from uh, scientific observer we as researchers go out and do in the field. There's a distinction here I'm trying to make. For the lack of the term or word, which I uh, would appreciate if you have a way to describe this science. Uh, so I use that local knowledge and testic knowledge, which will be the branch of the citizen science. So it must be local, it must be testic, uh, sort of there would be a citizen type of science, rather than a researcher here from outside, from a university or government institute and going there, conducting, measuring, and so on. So if I can take the, the image, uh, one of the images of these research methodology, if you look at this pen using the measurement of this fish, right? And just to get a sense of it. And what is this image really telling us about the science that they know and the science we know is a really intriguing question to me, at least, because this means science can never be precise, what they're saying. You, if you're looking for a precise notion of data, quantifying a precise notion of science, it is not. There's nothing such a thing exists out there. This is their, their indication. Sometimes they use their thumb to take pictures, which, which doesn't show up here. Sometimes they use their spoon to put right next to the fish. So sometimes they use a penny there's some money. Yeah, for instance, they used to, 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 to measure the size of the head uh, so that they can, they know, by looking at the head, they know the age of the fish, the village of them. So now you might just think, well, what is the relationship between this coin and this fish? The reason they put there is to uh, gauge, gauge the, the age of the fish, right? So there are so many types of measurement, forms of measurement that you may take, but none of this is going to be precise. <coughs> and that's exactly their point. And that imprecise science is what I might call it, it's a citizen science. In India right now, uh, Harini Naginturra, she's doing, for instance, with this uh, air, to measure air pollution, pollution. Uh, they have uh, a motorcycle, one guy holding that net throughout the city and collect the air. Um, after that, they compare those two net. One is a clean one, the other one is the one that just went through 45 minutes, then give it to the, uh, the mayor and the city council. This is the air that you are breathing. <laughs> And this is where there will be no <laughs> pollution like this exists. And that science is quite powerful. And similarly, uh, road temperature they measure. They compare the, the avenue road with the trees and road without the tree. And they measure the temperature of the road and throughout the city and give it to them. Here is the road without the temperature. The heat is this much. Here is with the trees, is the heat is this much. So such kind of science is I, I, what I'm referring to as a maybe citizen science. Uh, so just a, a clarification, yes, no. Um, I am, of course, looking for some kind of language that we can describe such, maybe local knowledge and tested knowledge instead of calling local uh, citizen science might be just a way to go with it. I'm not sure yet. Uh, I, I, I hear your question. If I, may, I think the power is actually on the combination of those two bodies of knowledge. Uh, one group treats as local indigenous knowledge, and another group treats as citizen science. And I have a great case where, you know, there's a, a blending of the two. Yeah. Yes, Jeff, please. Oh, okay. Thanks. So I think my question follows from many of the questions that have been asked so far, um, and particularly from John's comment about the film. It seems to work pretty well in the film. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is kind of a, a comes from a, 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 a skeptical, uh, it's a skeptical question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a social scientific epistemic way of posing the question. There's also just a more broadly political way of posing the question. So you've told a really nice story, mm -hmm. and based largely on taking, on believing 
what the people that you met and observed said about what they're doing mm -hmm. and showed us a little film that they made to represent mm -hmm. how wonderful what they're doing is. Mm -hmm. And it's a neat little story that fits nicely with like a certain combination of Lynn Ostrom and Jim Scott. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, also a heartwarming story in a way. But, but are there other stories that could be told about this? I think, you know, Frederica's question actually also applies to this. That, that would be less benign. Or, or just what other stories are being told? I mean, in, in fact, you know, the, the limit of the paper as paper, but we don't have to talk about it in that way, is precisely this question. You're not really, what, what are the other, I mean, I could imagine a neo-Marxist story. There's a whole bunch of questions I have to ask you about mm -hmm. property rights in that area and, yeah. you know, macro-political institutions. The World Bank both is part of the narrative, but also plays no role in your narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so help, help why, why believe that story relative to other stories? Let's take one more question. I had a couple, but one of my major questions mm -hmm. was um, whether the villagers faced any major roadblocks in terms of economic interests that were vested in having the dam there. Having the dam there? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, because it seems that they were very successful at their mobilization, yeah. but that is often not the case mm -hmm. when there are vested entrenched interests that kind of pose a roadblock in citizens reaching higher levels of political leadership. So that was kind of a, one of the questions I Yeah, had. it's kind of connected uh, in the foundation sense. I in the paper, descriptively, I described quite a bit about the role, the role of the World Bank officials and the funding that, that, that played. Uh, and World Bank mission is to sort of uh, open Thai market uh, and Thai political system into to fit into more of a global scheme of creating, if we can use the term, neoliberal uh, market society. And that's their mission, and they do it perfect in, in several countries around the world. Uh, what are the consequences of these villagers' action in stopping such kind of uh, a mission that might have given them more refrigerators, nice flat panel TVs, uh, Netflix and all kinds of modern uh, enjoyment we, we enjoy here, right? Uh, what are they losing from this game by bringing this game on? I think we have to look at two levels. One is that neatly defined material level of what we might call it enjoyment. Uh, second is uh, innate sense of social being of who we are uh, with the enjoyment. For instance, that um, uh, wow ceremony, non wow ceremony that they have with the big rock and with the flowers and uh, doing that, it's a very social event. It, it, that's one of the happiest time of these village. When they have these rapids emerge, the water receded and rapid emerge, they will have ceremony of such kind of spiritual ceremony, worshiping these rapids for giving habitat to these pregnant fish, right? and uh, the, be protecting these fisheries and so on. So they will also worship these. So the happiness there that they see or they, they enjoy is different types of happiness from flipping Netflix that we enjoy here. Maybe different types of, maybe materially driven different types of ha happiness. So as a social scientist, I'm questioning which type of happiness, the happiness that is promoted through this neoliberal market system that we enjoy every day, uh, conveniences and happiness and all kinds of satisfaction we gain from modern uh, society, which they seem to be missing if the, the movement is successful in making Thailand become more of their way of development, right? So that would be stopping the that society from becoming the World Bank sort of society, neoliberal market society where we are at. I, I, I think it's fascinating question is, there are, are there stories that villagers suffer because they stop the, 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 the institutional improvement or economic development? Yes, they are in, in, in Thailand. Uh, some of them are quite, quite happily to be away from uh, whatever global institution is, some localized sort of society. Uh, in Massachusetts, Berkshire County has their own Berkshire currency, I think. Uh, county has their own Berkshire currency. They are also sort of attempt and also CSA farmers that we have, community of CSA farmers uh, against the Kroger's and a big machinery of food production trying to uh, curve up their own sort of happiness, if you will, their own sort of institutional arrangement to create their own ways of happiness. So I guess 
I'm here trying to get, find parallel to the loss of uh, what they were losing and what they might be gaining from this is a question that I'm struggling, actually. I, I'm not proposing either way is good. Uh, it, it, it is a question that we all need to be aware of. And although that question tied to this notion of democracy that Tofil uh, contributed to understanding of this association of life and this fundraising parties and picnics and you know association of life at the church that people see and do personal relationships and so on, social capital. And if we build such kind of democracy, we'll be gaining democracy that is not so much of uh, institutional environment where impersonalization of institution is less, but more personalization of institution. Social relation will be more thicker in that sense. So which type of thickness do we want? And, and uh, which type of institution do we want? Is I think implicit question from your questions. And the question that I'm drawing is, I'm not sure where, which way to go. To vote for. <laughs> uh, uh, but in terms of agency and autonomy, if we bring Scots in, James Scotts in, I would vote for this kind of science and this kind of research uh, the, <coughs> and learnings and democracy. Uh, but if we bring in more of um, an, you know, convention of benefit we enjoy, we enjoy. And now I, as a citizen of that society, I would vote for this more of, well, this, you need to change. You, you have to change. And so we can build roads, and so we can have uh, uh, all kinds of cable networks and everything come into your uh, household in the village. And so that would be better actually for your education, so your kids can be globally uh, uh, fluent in, in culture and cosmopolitan sense. And therefore, that would be the future, and therefore, you should really embrace that. So I would basically work with the World Bank in that sense to push for such kind of institution. Back in my mind, too, is the particular time and place. Thaksin was, in many ways, beholden to a rural constituency. So that was the prime minister at the time. Yes. The regime now would be an entirely different context. But you've sort of left out of the equation the level of decision making at the apex, which I think was crucial in this case. Yes. It, it was crucial, yes. The implication is that today it would be different? Yeah, it would be very different. I don't it, think the regime today would even meet with the diligence potential. Do you? I mean, I don't know. You say regime today would not meet with or would, the be, would not meet with the villages? Yeah. True, yes. Uh, it would be the case. Now, the constitution that just approved. The new constitution. Uh, new, con new constitution. Actually, I, I was looking at the clause in that constitution. All of that section 56 is replaced by this language now. Automatically at one o'clock. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that I should be done. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so now the reversal of. Oh, reversal of this session 56. Right now, all session 56 to 59. Now the state shall delocate, the state shall decide, the state shall impose all kinds of developments. So the language is now reversed. By this region. So this and a, in that sense, this is the new one. This is the newest constitution right now. And in that sense, you're right. And I would also say, yeah, this regime is not going to necessarily uh, meet with the villagers or listen to this kind of research. Uh, we're going to go with our own way. Yeah. And they are not also going to listen to the War Bank so far, at least. So it's really interesting era in Thailand, uh, the political dynamic is uh, it's beyond um, my imagination or my analytic. <laughs> Uh, power here to really imagine where China might go with. So it's better to have a populist leader with uh, authoritarian aspirations than a technocratic government. I am not proposing that yet, <laughs> which way or, the, way or the other, but it's a very interesting. Uh, uh, Maybe sometimes think, populism works better. I than, think so, than, yes. Uh, sometimes populism works better than this uh, technocratic. I have a question about the other reports. You mentioned there were three other reports, yes. or two by academics. How yes. different were they from this? The War Commission on Dam sideline with the side with the, this report, the villagers study, which is interesting because the majority of the War Commission on Dam evidence and case studies were submitted by the protest leaders. I told you the guy who argued in Sri Lanka meeting at the yeah. OCD meeting. So basically, they looked at similar document and reached similar conclusions. And the other two, the other two basically reached to the technocratic, bureaucratic, techno, uh, 
uh, technocratic solution because it is basically tied to the EGET agency, which is the state agency that produce, that, that is responsible for providing energy, uh, solving engineering projects in China, like right? roads and power, grids and so on. So that agency provides the data to them, the independent commission. And they also went to the villages, but they, uh, at the end, uh, their conclusion was very much like those reports, the reports that are produced by uh, the, the EGET agencies. Questions? Yes, please. I was just wondering if there was any other reactions in the Thai society in terms of because of the, the, the consequences of closing or opening to them, you have balance in terms of energy that's being produced for the country. There were any other reactions for economic groups or there because there is a trade off in this decision, right? So, uh, is there any other thing that show up in, in this case that you can say? Can you clarify? I mean, is there some investor, investor, investors yeah. group in the, in the in the country that was putting money on the on the dam or putting money in the energy system that was against this decision? Because okay, the prime minister took a decision of opening the dam for this time, and there's there is there is a consequence in terms of the energetic balance for the country for the, yeah. the energy that was produced. Mm -hmm. So a, sh a shortcut answer is that's one of the reasons why this prime prime minister was ousted was because his movement to a more populist, local-based sort of uh, democracy, if you will. The democracy based on local majority population. The monarch in Thailand assumed that it has experts. It has institution, formal education institution that is serving the state. So because of such kind of popularity gained by these villagers, and you know, the voices of villagers are basically channeled through that sense. Shinawatra, the prime minister. He was considered by several royalist army leaders as a threat to the Thai monarchical institution. Uh, so the, if they eventually took, because he, he, was become, he became so popular, he's more, he was more popular than the king. People who watch his speech than the king going around the country and photo you know, ops and all that series rather than watching this prime minister. So in that sense, consequences for, for this is basically they are now shutting down that democracy and they are now shutting down giving to the state here yeah, the state and the king as a head of the state is the one that is going to make all kinds of decisions that you guys started talking about at the village level. We're not going to listen to you. This is this is not. We're going back to where we were, which was the king as a head of the state and technocrats ahead of these agency EGETs and the academics who are from Sri Lanka University, which will be Harvard of Thailand or MIT of Thailand or Yale of Thailand, will be the one where we're going to look forward to in terms of improving our society. That is the science, that is the democracy, that is political arrangement we want to go. Therefore, we're basically loudly saying with this constitution, we're going back that way. Your way of uh, the interjecting to the Thai society in your way since 1997 uh, economic crisis it's not going to go too far beyond the point that we are at. That's my reading house current situation so and the consequences to that. Promoting this oh. is to make you persona non grata in Thailand. That's right. Mm -hmm. Aurelian was joking, I mean half joking, when he said, so maybe technocratics, uh, maybe authoritarian populist is better than technocratic state. Mm -hmm. But there's a, it seems to me that, in, I mean, we talked about this last night, too, even as regards your relationship to your village yeah. and grow up. Yeah. It seems to me that that you are in this, you're minimizing, let's say, the value of the alternative. Let me put it in other terms. You, uh, yes, he, he was a kind of Democrat who played to the rural populations, which are the mass of the people. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, with the World Bank and maybe, and with the enlightened monarch yes. and with the uh, pointy-headed intellectual uh, technocrats, you have urban populations. Yeah. You have basically modern liberalism yes. and modern liberal conceptions of liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm very uncomfortable. I, I didn't grow up in a little village in Burma, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But, like, I'm very uncomfortable looking at the pictures of the fish. I mean, this is a real issue. My discomfort is not a, a normative statement, but mm -hmm. I'm very comfortable, uncomfortable looking at the picture of the fish mm -hmm. and seeing these people mm -hmm. and imagining that that ought to be, the, you know, the basis of a constitution. 
in a modern society mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That, that, that How is often do you eat fish? Jeff? What? How often do you eat fish? <laughs> <laughs> is your diet a fish based? I, I entirely agree. I mean, if you are asking me my personal take on that, that would be it. That, that would be what Tokyo will also agree with it. I mean, that's where the democracy should start and where democracy should be thriving, right? But there's, you know, improvement that has to happen uh, throughout the changes. So in that sense, I, yeah, I, you make, you make a clear point that I wanted to make as well at the end, which is yes, it, it will be the base, it should be the basis of constitutional order, basis of social economic institutional growth in Thailand. But now with this constitution and the infrastructure behind the coup and the yellow shirt uh, elites behind the coup, it's going to say no to that institution because we are the one who know better because I, we control technocratic institution and science and data and so on. That has a bleak future than the one that you just described, and I, which I agree with. I'm not sure that you agree with me, but it's okay. I think you, th you think I think you think you do. I mean, Tocqueville, Tocqueville was also nostalgic for feudalism. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying really is, I'm not really making this argument. But what I'm saying mm -hmm. is that there are places where it might be better to have enlightened, you know, Frederick of Prussia, mm -hmm. than to have uh, the peasants. At, you know, and their ways of being, governing. That's what I'm, I'm not really making that argument, but that's what I'm kind of implying. How do you know exactly? And, and Singaporean, well, how do you know exactly? <laughs> well, Singaporean thrive on that. Uh, they, 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 they give to Lee Kuan Yew and his institutional arrangement resounding yes, and until now has been continuing. It's better and for that society. But Singapore is a very different country. Singapore is a city. Right. Yeah, city state. Let me show that way. Yeah, true. And, and maybe, uh, if you put it Switzerland, technocrat, right? Switzerland is very neat, scarily neat if you walk on the street, so clean. Uh, so much, everything is on time, very, very scary, <laughs> right? Wow. Switzerland could be one of those places uh, where I would uh, put on, on the map. So, yeah, I, I would say, since I'm, I'm saying that I'm a, a supporter of technocracy, but for example, th I assume that there are liberal Democrats who really didn't like that at all. I know that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, people like me, who actually demonstrated against him yeah. on, the, on, on the name of liberal democracy as opposed to populism. Yeah. What do you do with that? Do you just say those people are like technocratic elitists who, I, I don't, I, that's a hard question. I think the uh, polycentric arrangement yeah. or the understanding there's differences yeah. or institutional diversity uh, play a contribution Absolutely. point to that, that, that one. Because as I said, the villagers knowledge alone is also not going to be uh, sufficient is to, to solve the problem they are posing, right? Yeah. And the knowledge of the World Bank and the state is also not going to be sufficient to solve the problem they are posing. And in, in some cases, this polycentric arrangement, for the lack of the word, maybe a blockchain kind of uh, uh, approach, might be a way to go, meaning that, yeah, so we got the, the point, and I, I, I see the point. Yes, please. I'm You're, you're being like patiently one. waiting. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> just one clarification. As, as the conversation uh, kind of like embraced the, the, the higher level decision making uh, in Thailand, I wonder like was, and this is just simple and curious, was this, was the timing of, of this project a strategic um, a decision? Was it out of luck? Uh, was it, was the, the, the populism of the regime uh, somehow, like, incentivize people to take it up at a particular time? Was there any understanding, this is, I guess, the question, that um, this particular project could, or was it contextual with the, with the issue of the dam? Um, but was there any understanding at the village level that that there were going to be repercussions at the national level? Or there were going to be responses at the national level and that they would have had to deal with those responses? Uh, or was it just, like, good luck? Um, let me uh, try to understand your question here. Yeah. You're asking, this case happened in the Thai political development. It's contextually just appropriate at the time and moment that this case was uh, conducted and became influential at that time and moment. It's due to uh, constitu uh, in the condition that are providing it to make it so, or is it just um, the, the, the sort of more of gradual social movement and change that is happening in Thailand? Right. Okay. Right. I would say 
more of gradual social movement side rather than just contextual. But shocks and certain uncertainties are always a, a part of the institutional change, right. right? So if you regard 1997 economic crisis as a shock to the Thai neoliberal market order that was going beautifully and quite well, uh, Thailand developed through that system, right? And now 1997 economic crisis imposed a shock to the system, right. and then Thai society began to pause itself and raise a question, are we doing, are we on the right path to this development of Thai society with a completely neoliberal market economic right. system. Um, the elite answer by giving, taking the IMF bailout loans at the time, and every three months, letters of intent from the sovereign state of, sovereign leader of Thailand had to submit to the IMF by saying we're doing this kind of changes, uh, currency value changes in financial policy, physical policy. Okay. So they were basically submitting to the IMF every three months. And basically, for, for villager and the supporter of this kind of protest would say, this is the loss of sovereignty of Thailand, and the loss of, the loss of who we are as a Thai people, yeah. because we're submitting to this global uh, system. Okay. So I think this, this, this case is not just, come, not just came out of 1989, between 1989 and 2003 era. This case came out of what James Scott in 1964 began to dissect this community by the book, Moral Economy of Peasants. The population that he then began to update his knowledge and the art of not being governed. So there's a persistence of this community in this Southeast Asia, zone of Southeast Asia. In fact, Victor Liverman, who's a historian at University of Michigan, wrote a two volume uh, book called Strange Parallel. And so Liverman deal with the question of one, Europe was organizing centralized order, the state centric centralized order. In fact, Southeast Asian indigenous leaders were also doing similar type of organizational political order like in Europe, but then there's a substantial uh, group of communities uh, against that centralized order. Right. So right. the story is really a long story. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, as I'm sure it is, yeah. but then the question becomes, what is the... Uh, uh, um, what is the context for this? Like, are there other projects going on in the country? Are they successful? Are they not? Why? Um, what is like the experience of community mobilizing in Thailand in through the lens of, of Scott's research or not? Yeah. Um, which I'm very sympathetic to, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but what is it telling us about social movements? About like uh, the you know like uh, well well being at the level of the community? What is the lesson that Thailand is is teaching? That's a great question, which is the question that I'm struggling. Uh, I, I think there's a, some uh, intrinsic value of this social movement and social changes that is happening in the, in the land of Southeast Asia or Zomia in general, yeah. right? Um, and which is the sentiment that Scott is taking. Maybe we should really not forget about, not uh, we should really study this zone of Zomia carefully to understand uh, the elements of uh, answer to the question that you're posing. Right. And because we so blindly believe or maybe take in this neoliberal market system as a system in which we feel we all feel just fine, comfortable, right. right? I think the consequences of that is similar to the consequences of naming or numbering those county roads in New England where local knowledge of road system is the road leading to, let's say, Martinville from us and the road leading to Martinville from Indianapolis will be different roads, right? But locally, we have that kind of society and knowledge. But the loss of that knowledge is going to be imposing some sort of question to us as a homo sapiens and human beings. What are we losing by making fine tuning such a uh, science and data and making efficient society in such a way? And that is, in itself, uh, a part of the question that this paper and myself is struggling with. And I, I just thought those are really open ended questions. Nobody has a uh, clear answer to it. And, yeah, it's a great question. And this relates to, well, your question earlier on the cohesion. This, uh, does it increase more communal cohesion in throughout Southeast Asia and Thailand? Yes. In fact, this uh, case study began to be a model for several river communities in Southeast Asia. Salon River in Burma, Irawadi, the Mitsung Dam case that shut down by the previous mm, quasi-military leader before Aung San Suu Kyi uh, stopped that huge, the, the largest dam project in Southeast Asia is one of them. So I think there's a thriving, growing movement of 
cooperative science and citizen science and democracy in a way that the other side of neoliberal market order might take it as an alternative sort of solution. Uh, of course, we need to sort those out because some of those are basically empowered by these uh, NGOs coming from the North Atlantic, you know, hegemonic power source. Uh, those NGOs are promoting for the sake of these those state too, because so Oxfam America or America or the IUCN could be concern, considered as a, a part of the Eurocentric order anyway, right? Amnesty International maybe part of the Eurocentric order anyway, right? So I think. It sounds cliche to say from this room, the institutional diversity has to be appreciated. How do, trying to add it on that a little bit, yeah. how do you see the role of the government on this contest? Because it just said because <laughs> the government today wouldn't agree with the situation, yeah. and probably the government on that time would agree, even if it was another scheme, if it was another. Uh, Probably, if it, 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 they were complaining about it, not showing the data, the science, probably they couldn't have reached the result in an, another way yeah. with this prime minister. I don't know, maybe in that situation. And how do you see the government, the role in this, in this, all this scenario? I think you know the answer as much as I do uh, in that question. This is to say that if we take the democracy as I phrased by the Association and Life of the People, if the government is such a government to promote self-governing communities throughout the nation, I think the role of government is quite clear. You and I can imagine several roles that they can, they can play, right? Mm -hmm. But if we take democracy based on the market order, neoliberal market order, uh, with the desire to plug into the global economy with the tight currency values and export-oriented economy and so on, you can see the role of government here being you just have to forget your fisherman's life because the life is dirty. The life is so messy. You're not developing from that point on. Your knowledge is, yeah, it's fishing knowledge, just fine. You know how to weave the nets. You know where the water flow. You know where the fish go. That knowledge is completely necess unnecessary if you want to move toward like people in Europe or people in a Hollywood movie that we saw in the Hollywood movie in the United States. So just forget it. That is really not now society, you should be going, in fact, the World Bank leader in the state used a term, a backward, it's going backward to the history, deep into the own millennia of history of suffering and poor and uneducated situation with sicknesses and disease. And so just let, get rid of that and move forward with this really a great healthcare system, market economy tied to global market system. That would be a way. So in that sense, the government role would be basically, yes, let's go and continue the dam. Um, you, just forget about your knowledge, just forget about your past, let's move on. And then, in fact, we might be high schools and middle schools that would be in tune with the new liberal uh, system, and your children will even don't know about what you did with your fish in, in the, about 40, 50 years ago, right? They will have uh, new knowledge to become a computer gamers and, uh, uh, and cyber uh, experts and all kinds of industrialist uh, youth, and that would be beautiful for China. Why don't we just do it? I mean, Singapore has done it, Taiwan is on the way, South Korea is now global leader on all these kind of technology. Let's go. That would be my government, and that would be my neoliberal uh, sort of institutionalist government, and that would be the role I would play. So what I'm saying is that you know all of these answers anyway, but that would be a type of... Uh, Time yeah. for one last question. Oh. <laughs> okay. It will be you. Oh, me? Yes. Um, oh, gosh. Can I ask two small questions? Oh, no question is small. <laughs> in, this room, in this room, as I knew as a, as a teacher and a student, no question is small, right? <laughs> well, one is a yes no question. That's right. <laughs> one of them is a yes no question, and then there's something kind of tied to that. Um, uh, my yes no question is I know that you said these communities created, um, it, it did all this independently. However, I'm curious if there was any NGO activity uh, within the village prior to their mobilization, like if they had done projects there or if they already had those links or whether the villagers kind of went and forged their links to the international NGOs and I guess yeah. national NGOs as well after. Mm -hmm. National NGO called the Assembly of the Poor, AOP, was the one that is 
basically organized by protest leader around Thailand uh, from the project like Pamung Dam. Uh, not just the dam itself, uh, not just this dam, but several road projects, uh, smaller dam projects, uh, also national park, uh, consequences of national park group, consequences of land confiscation group to build roads and so on, consequences of this uh, the, the unfair buying of land by the, actually not right now, Monsanto is everywhere in Thailand, mm -hmm. uh, coffee plantations that are. So there are several groups around the nation came together who were suffering under these projects, came together as an organization, and they established in 1995 called the Assembly of the Poor. And the Assembly of the Poor was a national NGO, if you can use it. Mm -hmm. And that group led such kind of uh, picking, OK, Park Moon case, a more powerful case, why don't we just invest our energy in protest movement? Because if we win that case, we're going to be able to gain. So this strategic play of local NGO, yes. I'm just very curious about, and if you want to explore it, um, I'm just throwing it out there, is I would love to kind of know the INGOs, um, how they grapple with local knowledge versus their own kind of imported Western That's a really great question. biases, because um, in development, I feel like there's such a emphasis, at least they say that they want to focus on local knowledge and local empowerment and yeah. things at the grassroots level, but they are often kind of, they struggle to implement that. Yeah. And so I was kind of curious just to kind of um, see or hear about what places like the World Bank or Oxfam and whatnot um, how they kind of dealt with that tension, inherent tension yeah. in their line of work. So that's an open-ended yes. question. You don't need to answer it right now. I'm just. <laughs> no, it's a great question and beautiful question to, to address. Uh, in this case, though, uh, Oxfam America basically was quite off. I mean, they, they just gave the money. You just do it. Whatever you're doing, just we support okay. it. So Oxfam America was quite um, distancing themselves from the actual research and actual production. They were just basically giving money to the uh, Regional Center for Social Science and Sustainable Development, which is a Chiang Mai University-based institution, just like the place like workshop. And the professor whose students, one of the students is translator that you saw in the documentary. He mm -hmm. was my research assistant, too. So the professor has these students coming from this region. They send them back there with the Oxfam funded cash. Okay, take the train ticket, go back, and do whatever you're doing with your protest leaders and so on. So uh, in that sense, Oxfam America was quite uh, sit back, relax, and just watch. But IUCN, on the other hand, take a different route. IUCN is more directly imposing their methodology into the villagers' research. We know the science. We are independent scientific community, IUCN. And so they have a different approach than Oxfam America. And JICA, which is a Japanese semi-state-owned independent development agency, has different approach too. So, and CEDA, Swedish uh, uh, Development Agency, had their own approach. CEDA was a little bit more in line with an international scheme of things in the region. Like, OK, we are, we're going to fund a part of the Mekong River Basin problem rather than tie this particular case. And so. Are you seeing a more of localized knowledge? Okay, we have scientists who understand the species of fish. We're going to go down with that. Your knowledge about measuring with coins and pins and fingers? No, it doesn't work for us. And we're going to just go with our own scientific knowledge about genes and protecting these species and so on. So they have a different approach. I guess there are no simple answers. Several NGOs came with their own different types of agenda and deal with different different. Great question. I mean, that, I just don't know how to really tackle this. I don't think they In, do either. Inherent conflict, you just said. Between I think the success of a uh, lecture like this is that it leaves us with more questions than answers. So for that, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>